Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Galesburg, Illinois. Uh, yeah, I did get a little bit lost, uh, but I wound up here in the Galesburg or the Knox County Extension office. I've uh, been at the Knox County Fair all day today, judging vegetables, flowers, agricultural products, whatever they throw at me, I'll judge it. Um, and try not to be too judgmental while doing so. So uh, we have got a fun show for you today. We're talking all about tomatoes, and we have a hostful show for us. So it's going to be Katie, Ken, and I talking. So let's introduce our co-host with us every single week. We have Katie Parker, local foods educator at Quincy. Hey, Katie. Hey, Chris. Did you see anything fun at the fair? Probably one of my favorite things to judge are the fairy gardens. Oh, They're yeah. so cute whimsical and I love the stories that are that you know you can write stories and stuff behind them so those are some mm -hmm. of my favorite things yeah yeah that sounds so, really do, cool when is the Adams County Fair is that coming up pretty we soon? have a couple more weeks before it starts so it'll be fun to see what the kids have been working on I, I remember Adams County Fair is always the hottest part of summer <laughs> it is last week of July first right. week of August oh Poor yeah timing on our part it, yeah, you know how to, to, to do it right. Uh, sweating, sweating pretty good out there with all mm -hmm. the animals and plant material and ag products. So, right. Oh, yeah. So, um, also, let's introduce uh, Ken Johnson, horticulture educator in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris and Katie. How's the weather out there at the fair? Well, the, the thermometer in the car read 88 degrees. Um, so, warm, no mm -hmm. breeze, humid. <laughs> yeah. that's odd for illinois <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah we're just hitting the nail right on the head there for our, our, our normal weather conditions so um ken i have to share yesterday i was uh, doing the mcdonough county fair uh judging and i met many you um if he had a beard i would have sworn it was you that walked through the door so i was next to the entomology table and i heard this kid just he loves insects. He loves them. And I'm just, you know, I just want to be like, yeah, dude, you go. Cause he, I'm pretty sure the judge at that table was just kind of like, okay, kid, you, you did a good job. Blue ribbon. He wouldn't stop. He just kept talking. And he was just like, did you know about this with the cicadas? And did you know this? And she just kept going and it was so much fun. Thought of you the entire time, Ken. Yeah. Sometimes I'd I've judged at the state fair entomology the last few years, and sometimes I get myself in trouble because <laughs> we go well over our allotted 10 minutes to judge. <laughs> as we you start and the, the kid are just like nerding out together. Yes. <laughs> start pulling out your phone, looking at pictures of the insects. You taking pictures of. Have you seen yeah. this one? <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of to switch gears here, though, and, and we'll probably talk about insects here, too, but we're talking tomatoes this week. So all about tomatoes. This is probably one of the most popular vegetable garden crops I think people grow. I know people grow tomatoes that don't even like tomatoes. They just grow them. To, they enjoy growing them or they're competitive. You know, I definitely saw a couple competitive tomato growers here uh, just so just today at the fair. So um, I, I just curious, Katie, do you you grow? have uh, some tomatoes in your garden this year? Yeah, we do. Uh, we have a small container garden at our house and then we have two high tunnels um, that have, one has two rows of tomatoes. I think it's like 142 plants. And then uh, another oh. high tunnel of um, I think 18 plants. Um, but I have found that the deer, um, like my tomatoes. So uh, Matt and I put up a fence this past weekend because uh, we're actually doing a cover crop study with Nathan Drahanning. And uh, one thing that I've learned from the cover crop study is that the deer like tomatoes best when there was cover crop previously. So um, yeah, good observations. Just makes some taste a little extra juicy and sweet. Maybe. I guess, I don't know what it is, but. So where's the high tunnels, Katie? They're at John Wood Community College. They're kind of hidden back by their trails that they have there. Cool. Well, next time I'm in town, I'll poke my head in there and check yeah, out definitely. all the tomatoes. Yeah. <laughs> you can pick a few and take them if you'd like. <laughs> Yay. So it's a no-till uh, cover crop trial, the yes. tomatoes? Yes. Okay. Very cool. And is um, do you know that Nathan specify the cover crop? Uh, we like we rye do. or something? 
we grew a zero or I on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that sounds like fun. Yeah. Well, I will be interested to know how good of a weed control that does. Yeah. So far, it's doing pretty well. But there's yeah. also no plants there. So, because <laughs> the well. deer ate But we'll get them replanted. Oh, yeah. So maybe that could be something we chat about later here, critters that attack tomatoes. Um, I know right. other places in Adams County, namely my parents' house, has been beset by uh, raccoons, mm. uh, squirrels. They've just gone crazy, it seems like this year, digging up uh, vegetables, container plants. And so it's been pretty wild there. Yeah. So Kent, do you have tomatoes growing in your neck of the woods, in your backyard? I do. I don't have 142, but. <laughs> well, what are you doing? <laughs> so we've got, uh, we've got two different kinds. We've got uh, Cherokee purple, which is a slicing uh, tomato. I think, how many do we have? We've only got 10 of those. Um, and then we have a, a paste tomato, uh, called Flores Little Napoli. Um, it's a determinant. So in the past we've grown Amish paste, um, super sauce hybrid opalka a bunch of different types of paste tomatoes but they're all indeterminate and by august end of august september i'm tired of picking tomatoes and don't really want to do it anymore so we figured we tried the determinate paste so they all kind of come in at once and it makes it a little bit easier to make the sauce and stuff that we want to because instead of it all being spread out over time so we'll have to see how that works all those determinate have fruit on them um they've had them for about a week or two now so Hopefully here in a, a few weeks, we'll start getting some tomatoes to pick. Do you make anything other than the, the paste, tomato paste with it, or tomato sauce? That's usually about it. Every once in a while, we'll make some salsa, um, cool. but primarily marinara sauce, pizza sauce, mm -hmm. all that cool. fun stuff. If we could find canning lids. <laughs> <laughs> Which there, yeah, there is, uh, Katie had mentioned, it was that you, Katie, earlier, that there is a shortage of canning lids. Yeah. <laughs> At least in Quincy, Illinois, there is. So yeah. if you find any, we uh, we'll we'll take comments and suggestions on where to find them. Mm -hmm. it, it's all black market canning supplies from here on out. So right, <laughs> <laughs> back alley deals. We'll trade tomatoes for canning lids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I, I guess I haven't learned my lesson when it comes to the determinate versus indeterminate tomatoes because I just keep growing those darn indeterminate ones. Um, and they are a mess at the end of the year. I'll agree with you. I, I have some Amish paste right now, but every year I grow Juliet's. Um, it's kind of like a cross between a, almost a Roma cherry, um, but you can slice them too. They're kind of, some of them get big enough for slicing. Um, but they, they ramble but I like them. They, they set on a lot of fruit throughout the year. So I have some of those already. Um, actually, we picked some Juliet's last night um, and we picked a few off of our cherry tomato. I'm not sure what it is. It was given to me by our neighbor. So I'm not sure. So do you guys start, <laughs> right? Do you guys start your own, own plants from seeds or do you buy them from the store? We start around just because... <clears throat> I don't know, we get kind of picky about what we're growing. We kind of have specific things we're looking for. So a lot of your paste tomatoes are indeterminate, but we wanted to, we wanted to try a determinate this year. So we, that's typically something you probably have to start on your own. If you want, if you're looking for something specific, typically you have to do that on your own. Katie, where did you get your hundreds of tomato plants that the deer have eaten? Did you start uh, those? Bronwyn Alley actually oh. uh, started them all, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nathan yeah, down near Dixon Southern. Springs. Mm -hmm. Well, Nathan's making the rounds around the state then. That's yeah, cool. he is. Yeah. I miss seeing Nathan. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in, in terms of starting tomatoes then, Katie, do you, uh, do you do seed or do you purchase transplants? I find it's probably more cost effective to do your own starting them from seeds. So yeah, we just, we started them from seed in the greenhouse um, and then transplanted um all of them outside we still have some in the greenhouse which is good because i'll replace some of those ones that the deer ate with the ones that we have in the greenhouse so that'll make up for it but so is it too late to plant tomatoes or is it july it's july 6th right now is recording um so we've had this question come up before and i think our our decision was uh it's better just to plant them outside and see if you can get some tomatoes rather than uh just 
not having any tomatoes at all. So it, mm-hmm. it's worth a shot uh, to see. And I think too, like you can uh, kind of look into the different types of tomatoes and see what their maturity date is and see kind of where you are and when, you, when that expected maturity or how long it takes for maturity. Yeah, you may not get you know your full harvest window, but you can still probably get some mm-hmm. at this point. If we have a mild fall and it stays warm into October, you might get a decent harvest. So right. though we start losing sunlight, but that, uh, yeah, I, th- I think that would still be, I, I, of course, we are also doing the purple and gold tomato things here uh, at the McDonough office. So our master gardeners are doing the unofficial WIU colors. And so we're not affiliated with WIU at all. They didn't ask us to do this. So don't go complaining to them about it. You can complain to me. Um, so we're, they're tomatoes that come, they're cut by color or antho tomatoes, and um, some of them in bread to be kind of yellow, and kind of purplish, bluish, kind of a darker color. And so they're by color tomatoes. We're going to see which ones look a lot like purple and gold with the WIU colors, since Macomb, where this is being done, is home to WIU, Western Illinois University, and that's their school colors. Um, and so we have several master gardeners that are trialing these out in their own gardens. They're gonna grow them, see what does best in terms of disease and pests and then flavor. And then we'll have our own little unofficial unveiling at the end of the growing season. So I'm excited to find out which one works. I don't know many of the varieties off the top of my head, but I know one is Brad's Atomic Grape. Um, one is, um, there's a couple wild ones. There was like yellow tiger. Um, I just found these random seeds on the internet. So just be careful <laughs> where you shop. Just FYI, we had some germination failures. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited to learn more about this. How many different kinds are you trying? So we have, I think about six different varieties of tomatoes that uh, I've identified just through inter- through looking through different seed catalogs, seed companies um, that have that yellow and kind of purpley color to them. Now, like Brad's Atomic, they start with that yellow purple color, but they actually mature to different other different colors. But so, you know, we'll see. We'll see how they look, though. All right. So we kind of mentioned this with indeterminates. With mine, I put them in the ground and I have a tiki torch and I just stake them up like that. But they're indeterminate. So, you know, what happens. They grow over the tiki torch and the tiki torch falls over, sets the backyard on fire, all that good stuff. So, um, how do you how can how do you train and then trellis your tomatoes? How do you keep them from going crazy? Um, so last several years we've done stakes. So I, we actually get um, usually get two by six boards, like twelve foot two by six boards or ten foot, and cut them into one inch sections and drive them into the ground. The problem we've had with that though is they start warping over time and they end up curving and and they don't really last more than a year. Um, just because they get so warped and stuff. Um, that's what we typically have done and we'll tie them up on their kind of prune off all the suckers. We just have one vine uh, going up. This year we're trying a basket weave, Florida weave, um, whatever you want to call it. So we've got T posts in the ground. Um, unfortunately, we could only find the um, six foot T posts. So they're not quite tall enough, but uh, we've got a T post at the end of each uh, row and then a T post in between in the middle. So we've got kind of two plants, two, three plants in between the T-posts. And we're just stringing a, um, a string in between those plants and then looping it back around. And I think we've got three of those on there, do like every 12 to 18 inches. So kind of a mix between staking and, and um, using a, um, <laughs> I'm drawing like here, a, a cage form. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how that works out. The determinants for growing, they only get 12 to 24 inches tall. So we've got the stakes in the ground, but we haven't done anything with them yet. They're still kind of supporting themselves, but the indeterminates, we've had to do that. And some of them I'm, I'm pruning off all the suckers. Some of them I'm leaving the suckers on there just to kind of see how it works. The suckers, they're the things that grow up in like the leaf axle, right? So yeah. you're, you leave some and then you prune some? How, how, explain that, sorry. So when, when we do that, when we stake them, what I do is I prune off all the suckers. Okay. So we only have one main vine. With the basket weave, I'm trying some, I'm pruning off most, if not all the suckers, and some I've just left all of them on there. 
just to kind of see how it works. And they're the ones I haven't pruned are kind of eating <laughs> everything else. They're like small shrubs mm-hmm. right now. So yeah, that may not have been a good idea. Katie, how, so how are you, Ken sounds like backyard type garden. You are managing over hundred. What, like when the deer stop eating them, like, you know, how do you plan to manage and train all of those? Is Are you going to use a similar system? Yeah, we'll use the Florida basket weave and we'll just, um, we'll have stakes more frequently between the plants and then just weave um, some tomato twine uh, between the plants to help them, help to support them as they grow up and get taller. I do need to check with Nathan though. I need to figure out what variety he, uh, tomatoes he bought hmm. or brought. So. And so do you also, what do you prefer? Do you leave the suckers or do you prune them off? I've been pruning them. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's easier to manage a little bit more. Um, last year we did not prune suckers. Uh, and we just had like a mass of tomatoes. Um, I also accidentally gave my aunt an indeterminate tomato and I don't think, well, I mean, she wasn't totally familiar with it. Um, and she's like, I don't know what this tomato is, but it just keeps producing like crazy. (laughs) And it's like, uh, oh, I think I gave you the wrong tomato, but I mean, I mean, they're, they're both nice, but, uh, I think determinants are way easier to manage. It's just, you guys are just throwing indeterminate around like a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> I agree though. So um, I found, especially Katie in that situation, when you're managing like long rows, if you don't prune off those leaf suckers or the, the suckers in that axle there, that, yeah, you're hunting for tomatoes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like a jungle last year. Cause we just, we did it. We planted light and we had issues with rabbits feeding on them. And so then we had to replant. And then I think it got, we, we mo- ended up moving. And so it was just chaotic. So yeah. we kind of failed, but you always learn something from your failures. That's right. That's right. That's, but by the time we retire, we will be really good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll know stuff more than we do now, hopefully not get set in our ways. That's, that's the dream, right? Right. So Ken, what else do you do to take care of your tomatoes this time of year? I mean, we're getting into the nineties, it's summertime. Uh, do I, you're doing in ground sounds like, so would you fertilize? What help me? Cause my tomatoes need help. So I, we have never fertilized our tomatoes. Um, I think we've got good enough soils that we don't have to, um, you could do a side dress, um, a fertilizer, which is just put it kind of along next to the plants. Um, do that usually kind of a balanced fertilizer is what's typically recommended. Um, and we'd mulch our tomatoes. So we rake all the leaves up and, and shred those leaves in the fall and store them in our garage over the winter and summer. And we'll mulch our garden with those. Um, also did a, so we have kind of two separate uh, vegetable beds we've got, got a main one and a smaller one we typically grew um, cucurbits and uh, squash and stuff in um, the squash bugs were getting real bad so we kind of flipped them this year so our tomatoes are in our cucurbit bed and then last year we had grown uh, cover crop rye cover crop so that's all laid down um, as a mulch in there and as that starts breaking down and and stuff and we get bare patches I'll go in and and put some leaf mulch down but so far, so good. And that's going to help keep weeds down. That'll help with um, retaining some of that soil moisture. So don't, hopefully don't have to water quite as often. And with all that rain we got, we haven't had to water <laughs> yet, but it's getting warm and drying out. So we'll probably have to start on the watering again here soon. I was noticing that yesterday, um, but I think we are going to get a rain. Well, I guess they pushed it back to Saturday, but we might have to do a quick quick uh water mm-hmm. next day or two it's been getting pretty warm things have dried out quite a bit since our last couple of weeks of non-stop rain mm-hmm. and i was i yeah i know i was looking at the weather map earlier this week and it said wednesday rain maybe thunderstorms but yeah it looks, sounds like i will be watering tomorrow wednesday yeah 
So Katie, what Ken describes where his tomato bed is with the, the rye, that is the same goals that you're exploring with the, the cover crop trial, right? Right. I mean, we terminated the cover crop, so we sprayed it before we planted the, er, the tomatoes. Um, so we did half tomatoes, half peppers. Um, and so we no longer have any cover crop there. And so no coverage. Um, but it was quite significant. So after planting, we had to do a lot of hand watering. Uh, we, we, it's not, it's a high tunnel, but it doesn't have a cover on it yet, uh, which actually works out well for the study. Um, but so we were having to hand water with just a hose for a bit. And then we got all that rain, um, but it was, it was just amazing. Like the water runoff with uh, no cover versus cover. Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of the water was just absorbed into the ground where there was cover crop versus where there was no cover crop. And, you know, you could easily see where you had watered. It's, it's just becoming more and more popular, those cover mm -hmm. crops. Yep. I actually have a bag of wet, red winter wheat right next to me. Like oh, cool. A five-pound bag for gardeners. So, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I would like to incorporate more cover crops in my bed. So I, my tomatoes... Uh, are planted directly into lawn. <laughs> so at our new house, we do not have many full sun areas. Um, and so I have actually taken big sheets of cardboard. I know this is going to be controversial. I've taken big sheets of cardboard and I've cut holes in them and I've laid them on the lawn and I've planted my tomatoes in the little holes. And so um, talk about water runoff. When there's rain, that cardboard just sheds water like crazy. Mm -hmm. It's not as permeable as people think. And so I don't recommend cardboard as uh, like a mulch layer. It's just something I needed to kill the grass real quick. So um, also, if you ever think of using cardboard, make sure you remove your staples. You got to remove all the little labels and tape and all that stuff. You don't want that in your soil. So yeah, that's my cardboard one, soapbox. One thing we've done when replacing lawn into garden is we've just sprayed it. Mm -hmm. And depending on what you use, sometimes you can go in day after or three days later mm -hmm. and plant. We just plant directly into that dead grass and kind of use that as a mulch mm -hmm. too. So it's another way you can do it. Do what Ken says. If, if you don't mind, <laughs> I mean, if you don't want to use herbicides and obviously that's not going to work, but if you don't mind using herbicides, it's quick and easy. Yeah. I, I'd say that that mulch layer though, whether you're using a terminated cover crop, shredded leaves, um, in my case, the hope is to replace the cardboard, which is already disintegrating, but to replace it with uh, like wood chips or something um, that is a bit cheaper than bagged wood mulch. So <laughs> it's still like $3 or no, sorry, $10 for three bags. It's, I'm going to need a lot more. Mm -hmm. In terms of problems that you might be encountering right now, um, Katie, we mentioned deer. Ken, are you encountering any problems with your tomatoes or do you foresee anything that is upcoming? Well, knock on wood. So far, so good. We haven't really had any insect problems or disease problems, even though we've had all that rain. Um, last I looked, we didn't really have any uh, foliar diseases or anything in there. Haven't really had anything eating um, the plants. So I I'm hopeful it'll remain that way, but I really doubt it will. Um, <clears throat> you know, we'll have there's a bunch of different types of caterpillars that'll move in, and you know, your big hornworms that'll eat leaves. There's tomato fruit worm or corn ear worm, depending on what it's eating, will come in and eat the fruit. There's all kinds of different um, foliar diseases um, and stuff. So I try to go out and scout at least once a week, if not two or three times a week, just because the sooner you find that stuff, the easier it is to manage that and stay on top of it. If you don't go out in your garden for a week or two and that stuff gets established and starts spreading, um, it, can be, it can be difficult to get a handle on that stuff, especially with diseases. Because um, once that, that leaf tissue is infected, there's not really anything you can do about it. You can't, there's nothing you can spray that's gonna get rid of that disease on those infected leaves. You can only protect um, the unaffected foliage. So if you remember nothing else from this podcast, go out and scout your garden. Mm -hmm. get on top of that stuff that's a, another reason for mulch is it protects the the from soil splash where you can get infection mm -hmm. and crop rotation mm -hmm. rotating that's another reason we moved our tomatoes because we were getting a buildup of of some of that um septoria leaf spot 
um, early blight and thracnose, those real common ones were just each year we got a little bit worse, a little bit worse. So <clears throat> switched beds and hopefully we won't have as much trouble because there shouldn't be as much disease over in that area. So at the fair this morning, someone, uh, they were saying they saw something the first time they've ever seen it. They saw a corn borer going into their tomatoes and about midway up the stem of the tomato, I saw the hole with the frass coming out. They picked, pulled it out and they said it was corn borer. Is that, they said they'd never seen that. Is that something either of you've heard of or encountered? I've not heard of it or encountered it. Me either, but it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. He says he lives, I mean, he lives right next to a corn bean field. So mm -hmm. um, it, it, and he's even had Japanese beetles eat his tomatoes because there's, he's got an apple tree right there. And mm -hmm. so he's like, every year they strip the apple tree and there's some that just, they land on a tomato leaf and he guess they just eat a little bit of it, but they don't like consume it like they do other plants. He's just, right. yeah. I guess if you're hungry enough, like the deer, you know, if they're hungry <laughs> enough, they'll eat it. Right. So is there anything, uh, any chemical recommendations uh, from either of you is for treating some of these insects or maybe disease, or is it more of a, hey, prevention measures, it's gonna go 80% of the way for you? So we had a to tomato hornworm on our plant, uh, on one of our tomato plants the other day. So I, I mean, it, for me, it's very satisfying to pick tomato hornworms off the plant. Uh, but so I, I mean, I was looking at the plant, checking to make sure there wasn't another one. There wasn't a ton of feeding, but I just wanted to make sure there wasn't a, a little guy on there. Um, but I actually found, um, some parasitic wasp, uh, eggs. Is that the correct, correct term, Ken? I don't know. It was just their little thing on the underside of the leaves. So that's a nice control tactic, I guess, to, for tomato hornworms. Um, but they do make like BT sprays that you can use uh, if you're not into picking them off the plants and smashing them over. We put them in a bucket of water before too. They don't seem to like that. So was the, the egg thing, was it on the caterpillar? Or no, was but it wasn't on the okay. caterpillar, it was on the leaves. I found two of them. Was it, like on a, was it on a stalk or was it just a... Under the leaf. Egg on the leaf? Yeah, I can show you a picture. I'm sure. I've, I've also heard that your hornworms, you can eat them, fry them, and they taste like a green tomato. So yeah, I've been told. I've, disgusting. <laughs> 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 I've never tried it, but the I get some this really year. really like to. it, too, because we left that bucket. of Because last year we had a ton of tomato hornworms. We had abandoned our garden for a week. And my mom had not gone out and checked it or anything. And we went, walked out there and there were like no leaves on the tomatoes. Mm. And so we just, we pulled off a huge bucket full of tomato hornworms and left it outside. And the next day they were all gone. You see that? Yeah, it looks like a cocoon or something. I found that one and then here's another one. I'm not sure what that is. If you just found the next invasive species that attacks tomatoes, <laughs> should give I'm you a raise. It's good. <laughs> Hopefully, it's weird. I've seen some some diseases will make the caterpillars look fuzzy, like a fungus, but that looks like a cocoon. Yeah, like it's been something is about to come out of there. <laughs> I have to go home and check. I won't put it in a container. See what comes out. <laughs> I don't think I want to touch it. Take the whole leaf off. So I've I have been getting other questions, and also um, on the Illinois Horticulture Facebook channel, we've had um, channel. What do you call those things? Pages, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know what Facebook is. Um, so on the book face, there are these pictures people are showing us of curled tomato leaves. I tried to weigh in, but it, it looks like physiological leaf roll and that's just like it gets hot and the leaves curl up a lot of people just say herbicide damage herbicide damage 
I don't know. Is there any way to distinguish between those two? I don't know if, if like herbicide damage it in the way it curls, you know, if it curls yeah. up, curls down, if there's any way to tell difference there. I think a lot of it would be annoying if <clears throat> any herbicides have been used, but with some of those, they can move mm -hmm. a good mm -hmm. distance. So, and two, you know. I would think with herbicide damage, you'd expect more. Well, I think it, it also depends, but maybe we would expect more of it on the tips of the plant. And tips. And look, I mean, it, other parts of the garden too, you might see mm -hmm. damage too. Well, I'll say that tomatoes are, for some of those, tomatoes are particularly sensitive to like your 2,4-D. And so they, you whisper that name around them and they'll start, <laughs> start curling and puckering up. Yeah. Why did you say, don't say that word in my garden? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. So, okay. So we're some other problems out there, leaf curl, possibly herbicide damage. Um, what about blossom end rot? Um, Okay, so what is it? Is this a problem with calcium or is this a problem with water? So I think the kind of the old school of thought is it's calcium deficiency. Um, so it's not a disease, which a lot of people think to begin with, but it's actually some kind of physiological disorder. I think the old thinking is that it is a calcium deficiency. Uh, but some of the, some, there's been some papers come out in the last several years um, where they've actually tested the fruit. Um, and they've actually had normal levels of calcium in them for, for just before they start developing blossom end rot. So I, th I think the newer thought now is more it's just stress related, whether that's um, uneven watering, too hot, um, stuff like that. So some kind of stress is causing um, that blossom end rot. And I think the most frequent is most frequent cause of it is a kind of infrequent uneven watering with all that rain we got. You know, we shouldn't have too many issues with it um, as long as you stay on top of the watering. Um, and if it doesn't get too terribly hot, um, you should be okay. I mean, a lot of times tomatoes kind of end of summer into fall are a lot better shape than those growing in the heat of the summer just because tomatoes don't like really hot temperatures, especially at night. Mm -hmm. um, they may not bloom, so you don't even get fruit to begin with. Um, but as it starts cooling off, you get more fruit you get less blossom and rot, stuff like that. That's good to know. Usually, sometimes my tomato plants don't make it to the end of the season. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, so usually, usually, be... by, usually by August, September, I don't care about them anymore and whatever happens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're just like, All right, I want lettuce now, you know, so start planting lettuce and turnips and broccoli. All right. So we covered some problems, but now do you have any harvesting, you know, no, tips um, do we need to wait for them to turn the color that they're supposed to be? I, I, I don't know. What am I allowed to harvest green tomatoes? Yeah, if you want to. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to get arrested for it. The tomato plants aren't coming to get me. Right. Um, Does it taste worse? Or I typically better? say the longer you let them ripen on the vine, the better tasting they are. Um, so that's probably why there's kind of that thought of not harvesting green tomatoes. Uh, but last year we had some tomatoes, we were getting pretty close to a frost. And so um, we harvested quite a few green tomatoes um, and let them ripen inside. And with tomatoes, kind of how those fruit develop is they'll start growing, they'll kind of, they'll grow, get their full size, and then they'll start putting on color. So as long as they get to that mature green stage where they're fully developed size-wise, you can pick them and, and kind of ripen them indoors. So once they, once they start to loot, maybe get a little bit of color on them, then you can pick them and ripen them um, indoors. And we've had to do that in the past because squirrels, they'll come in and just about when they're fully ripe, squirrels will come in and take bites out of them and stuff. We've, so we've resorted to putting plastic bags over our fruit clusters to keep them off, but then water gets in there and it's just, it's gross when you open it up because it's just <laughs> rotten, nasty tomatoes and fermented there, so. tomato. Yes, <laughs> so I don't necessarily recommend that. We did tear holes at the bottom. I helped a little bit. Um, but we've harvested them green just so we can get a few before the squirrels do. Okay, so I and I've always uh, I've debated like should I harvest them right now, maybe a little bit early, 
because it never fails. Like it, I, maybe I have to leave. I can't be in the garden for a few days or there's going to be a big rain coming. I have to keep me out of the garden. And I come back and all the tomatoes got a split down the side. So it is that from water? I have no idea. Why, why is the tomato splitting? I just waited too long or too much water or what? It's probably water, especially if we get a little dry and all of a sudden they get a bunch of water. They take up all that water and that fruit just can't expand fast enough and they start cracking. And then you can get fungus and bacteria in there and it gets nice and funky. So, <laughs> so yeah, if it's been dry and you haven't, you know, we got a bunch of rain coming, it may be a good idea to, to pick some of those tomatoes that are, are getting pretty close to being ripe, just so they don't start cracking on you. Oh, tomatoes with cracks. So you want your plumbers, not your tomatoes. <laughs> well, so it, it, after you harvest, my tomatoes don't make it too long. Um, sounds like, Katie, you're, you've you been looking for some canning lids, Ken. I know you saved preserved tomatoes for, for later use, I think. Um, any tips for me in, in, in making it, in case I have some extra tomatoes? Uh, it sounds like we have to do the black market canning stuff, but you know what beyond that? So we often freeze tomatoes. Um, so that's a nice option too, if you can't find the canning supplies. Uh, and so that's a nice resource. If you wanna make some like lasagna or something mm. this winter, it's a good option. Make some salsa, so you have fresh mm -hmm. salsa. Give them away to people. If your neighbors don't have a garden, see if you can mm -hmm. pawn them off on them. Mm -hmm. You got a local food bank, see if they'll take some. Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to try to preserve them or you can't. Salsa was our, our 2020 um, COVID meal of choice. So uh, we ate way too much salsa last year. Did you uh, make your own salsa or did you buy it? <laughs> <laughs> we bought it. Or we, we, we did help someone move and they gave us a bunch of different types of salsa that they made in their garden. Some was That's like cool. hot, some was like spicy and hot or not spicy and hot. What am I saying? Sweet and hot. That's what I want to say. Somebody had like mango in it. I was Ooh. like, whoa, this was, it was good. All the different, all good. Some hurt, but good. Well, I, after talking about all this, I don't know, I, I, I like making lists. And so Katie, do you have any favorites that you've grown over the years or anything that you want to try maybe in the future? Yeah. Um, so cherry tomatoes have always been a, a favorite. And so this year we're trying a black cherry tomato. Um, and so hopefully we have um, some green fruit on the on the plant right now. So hopefully those will ripen and we can try those for the first time. Other than that, uh, we like to do like a, a Roma tomato for sauces and then um, a slicing tomato because we do love our BLTs. Um, so mm -hmm. just an, a nice mixture of the three. I haven't had my summer BLT yet. Mm. No, that sounds so good. It's a staple. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, Ken, do you have any tomatoes, uh, some favorites of yours that you enjoy growing? Um, so sort of kind of like Katie, we do the, the paste and the slicing. Um, my life really likes, what my wife really likes Cherokee purple. So that's why we grow that. I'm, I'm not a big slicing tomato person. So <laughs> whatever she wants to grow, we grow. I, I like more of the paste um, and stuff. So, you know, the apalka we grew, um, those are good tasting, really good size. But again, they were they were indeterminate and kind of got tired of <laughs> that being strung out for so long and stuff. So kind of excited to see what the, the ones we're growing this year, like the determinant and if they turn out well, that may be the way we go from here on out. So we can get all of our canning done at once instead of do it every couple of weeks. So I'm learning, I need to pay more attention in the seed catalog when it says determinate and indeterminate, because it sounds like determinate's the way to go. Does it stop producing tomatoes though? No, it just stops growing a certain height. The term, they kind of set their fruit at once and they're, they're done. And they're typically. done. Whereas in the term, yeah, they, they'll keep going until there's a frost. Well, now I have oh. another, I, I like, uh, um, I'll have to grow both. That's it. That's the solution. <laughs> um, I will get a second job, make more money, buy some more land and I'll grow both. That's Okay. Can do they make like alternative colors for paste tomatoes? They do what? 
Anything other than the red for paste tomatoes? I haven't have really found looked. any. I no, was I just thinking, really, like, really how looked. cool would it be to have like green or yellow mm -hmm. pizza sauce? Or... I mean, that may be next year's project. Yeah. <laughs> I'll find some of those. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, like, the ketchup when we were kids that was purple? <laughs> and there's there's oh, a yeah. green ketchup too, wasn't there? Green, green yeah. and purple ketchup. I bet the, like, the your Cherokee purple tomatoes. Those are slicing. Yeah. And we've done, we've tried to make, we've made sauce with slicing in the past, and that takes forever mm. to cook all that down. So for gigs, yeah, for a while we just did slicing and we would make some some sauce here and there and switched over to the paste so we don't have to do nearly as much cooking because boiling tomatoes when it's August oh, yeah, <laughs> is no fun. fun. Do you have to peel the skin off? With your paste tomatoes do you do that so there's a lot of people will, will blanch them mm -hmm. put them in boil them and then put them in cold water and peel them off last few years we just do the whole thing um run it through a food mill and that gets a lot of it off but there's still skins in there but right. i'm lazy i, I don't want to have to do an extra step so can you and your toys okay i've learned today you have a table saw you must because you're ripping boards <laughs> two you now have a food mill Attached to uh, what is food a processor? food mill? Yeah, it... I, it's like a, a cone, metal cone, like a sieve. You got a little wooden thing you smush. It's actually my wife's oh. her grandmother's, so it's an oh, old okay. one. And we do have a table saw now, but when we were cutting these boards, we were doing it with a circular saw. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you have all your fingers still? <laughs> <laughs> I got a little dicey well, at times, but yeah. All I could think of too is when you were talking about this, I'm like. One year for lumber, like lumber's through the roof. <laughs> yeah, that's why we didn't do it this year. <laughs> T-post for the win, yes. Right. Yes. Well, I don't know. I'm So I'm stuck in Galesburg. It's an hour drive home. I want to go home and take care of my tomatoes now. And I'm hungry. <laughs> You're talking about all this. <laughs> so uh, it, I don't know. Now I'm hungry for tomatoes. I want a BLT, like really badly. It's nothing... All right, last thing we can talk about, and then we'll, we can sign off and we can be done. People, they're probably tired of hearing us talk about tomatoes if you're still here listening and watching. Um, but have you ever gone into a, a locally owned restaurant, middle of summer, height of tomato season, and you get these pasty white tomatoes? Do you just throw them back and say, I don't want them? <laughs> Give me real tomatoes? Never I shouldn't be happen. mad about that. Okay. I understand when people are serving tomatoes in the middle of winter and they have they're just white in the middle but not in the summer anyway that's my people don't care about that stuff that's but that's my complaint that's your uh well your commercially grown ones they have to stand up to shipping so they're <clears throat> a little more firm and maybe not quite as ripe as you'd like when they're okay. picking all right well i understand okay i just got to get over that I'll bring my own tomato next time. It's like, excuse me, no, and I'll bring out my cutting board and my knife and tomato. And it's like, I'll take care of this. Yeah. That's, that's a good business proposition for you. You can, um, since you're buying this land for all these indeterminate yeah. tomatoes, you can be like, <laughs> I'll sell you some tomatoes. I'll grow them right to your front door. You right. Know, indeterminates. I could just stand outside the doors of these restaurants and just sell them to people walking in. It's like, hey, buy my tomatoes. Carry your vine from your house to your, the restaurant. Mm -hmm. They'll grow so long. There's people yeah. who bring their own like silverware to restaurants sometimes. I don't know if you've seen that before. Um, my grandpa owned a restaurant, so he yeah, told me about that. So anyway, yeah, I'll just bring my own tomato. Just put it on the table. There you go. You can build yourself a greenhouse. You can keep them going. Mm -hmm. There you go. You're indeterminate. You can just start looping them back on each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your trees. Live for a year plus. <laughs> Well, Ken and Katie, thank you so much for answering my questions about tomatoes and talking about tomatoes today. Um, yeah, I'm just too, I'm, I'm really pumped up. I want to go home and get in my back in my garden, maybe put some actual mulch down and not cardboard. So uh, that's, that's something to try out. So, well, thank you each of you for talking tomatoes today. I'm excited to see your guys' tomatoes once they start producing. Katie, go grab that thing and put it in a container. So we can oh, see yeah, yeah, yeah. Into. I will. I will. I was looking at more in depth. I think, I don't know. We'll have to look at it further. 
All right. And Katie, let's do this again next week. Since Chris is abandoning us. <laughs> you will do this again next week. And I hear you're yeah. calling Andrew over too. <laughs> is he coming to talk with you with you guys? Yeah, but he just doesn't know it yet. That's right. Andrew's on vacation. I'm about to be maybe on vacation. We'll see how that goes. And so, well, you know, next week, listeners, uh, you'll be free from me, but you'll have to still be with Ken and Katie and Andrew. Um, and so listening and talking about what they are talking about. I don't know what I, I I'm, I'm lost. I'm lost in tomato land. Right Maybe now. surprises all around next week. That's right. There's surprises all around, including right now. Um, I'm surprising uh, everybody, myself here. So um, thank you listeners for listening because that's what you do best. Check you even get the closing right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this uh, podcast is... Uh, produced by this podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson edited by me Chris Enroth um, oh man I'm just out of order I am just totally out of order anyway folks listeners thank you for doing what you do best and that is listening or if you're watching this on YouTube watching and as always keep on growing <laughs> <laughs>